Okay, so uh, today uh, I'm going to talk about computation of epsilon Nash equilibrium, and uh, let me just uh, reiterate what epsilon Nash is. So we have uh, p in delta m, q in delta n epsilon greater than 0 let me make it p epsilon q epsilon and this is a p epsilon q epsilon is epsilon Nash equilibrium if and only if uh, For every p in delta m, p transpose a q epsilon is less than equal to um, p epsilon transpose a q epsilon plus epsilon. Okay, and for every q in delta n. P epsilon transpose B Q is less than equal to P epsilon transpose B Q epsilon plus epsilon A and B are payoff matrices. So today's class we are only considering payoff matrices. Okay, so the goal is we are given matrices A and B, okay, and we have to compute epsilon Nash uh, for this game. So, how do we go about computing epsilon Nash? So, today I am going to cover two papers. One was uh, published in 2003, and the other one is published in 2016, I think. So. Uh, so those are the two papers we will be talking about. Okay. So the idea, the key idea here is uh, to reduce the search space for epsilon Nash. So remember, you could have an epsilon, your epsilon Nash will stay in this space and this space is huge. It has uncountable number of number of points. So the idea is from this delta m, how should we pick points so that we are guaranteed to have an epsilon Nash within the set of finite number of points, okay? These are all finite number of points, okay? And uh, what we want to have is a theorem or a lemma or something, a proposition which can show that we can look for an epsilon Nash equilibrium within this class and we know that there exists at least one epsilon Nash in this in this finite set of points. Okay, so that's that's the first result that we want to prove. So what we want to come up with is what should the set of points be? The set of points that sits inside delta M and contains a uh, epsilon Nash equilibrium. So here is what uh, here is how the authors define this set of points, simple strategies. There are two ways to define simple strategies. One is the easiest way and the other one is more complicated way. And I'm going to cover both the ways of defining simple strategies. So the easy way is as follows. You define, so pick K, K in N. And you define delta m k as a vector p in delta m such that k p, so k is a natural number, k p is a vector of uh, integers. Okay, so you are essentially considering. Uh, 
So you have this vector, let's say p equals 1 over 3. So let's say k was equal to 3. So you take p equals 1 over 3, 2 over 3. You multiply it, compute kp, you have 1 and 2. Right? So it's a vector of integers. If k was equal to 3 and p was equal to 1 over 6 and 5 over 6, then kp is equal to 1 over 2 and 5 over 5 over 2, it's not in delta m k. Right? So we want kp to be a vector of integers. Okay? So that's delta m k. And this p, such a p, is said to be a simple strategy. Why? Because it's a, it's, so you pick a value of k and that k should be the denominator of all the elements within this vector p and the numerator can be chosen accordingly. So this was 0 over 3, this was 3 over 3, you have kp equals 0 and 3 and that's also fine. Okay, so that's uh, part of this particular set delta mk. Okay, so is the idea of simple strategy clear? Okay. Now, so this is the easy way of defining simple strategy. Now, let's see a complicated way of defining the same strategy. Okay, which is how, so this is not the way they have defined it in the paper, okay? So I have to spend some time figuring out what exactly the simple strategies are, but uh, this is exactly what it is. So, but it's, it's good to know how to define it, how they have defined it in the paper because it's needed for a proof in their paper. So they define k multi-sets uh, of pure strategies, okay? So k multi-sets are, so what are multi-sets? So multi-sets are sets in which you can repeat the elements of the set, okay? So your set is, so set is uh, p comma b, then three multi-sets are, I can, I can repeat the element, so that's t, 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 b, t, t, b, t, b, b, and then what else? B, b, b. Did I miss anything else? No. Okay, so these are the set of all three multi-sets of the original set TB, okay? So you can, so it doesn't matter whether, so this is equivalent to saying T, B, T, and that's equivalent to saying B, T, T, okay? It doesn't matter how many times an element has been repeated Repetition is allowed, but these all sets where you have two t's and one b and two t and one b, it's all the same, okay? They are all the same set, okay? Now what I do is I define a vector p from each of this multi-set as follow. Let me erase this. So I, I endow each of this set with uniform distribution. So this t appears with probability one third, this t appears with probability one third, this t appears with probability one third, and then I define my probability vector p as number of t over three. I mean, I should just write it as k because three equals k, k equals three here. Number of t over k and number of b over k. Okay, so that will be the probability distribution if I endow each of these multi-sets with uniform distribution. So in this case, P is 3 over 3 and 0 over 3. In this case, P is 2 over 3, 1 over 3. P is 1 over 3, 2 over 3. And in this case, P is 0 and 3 over 3. Okay, and you, so you have, so you can define delta mk as the set of strategies 
the set of strategies that are induced by having a uniform distribution within the k multi sets of uh, of the original set of pure strategies okay yeah why is there three elements what sorry why are there are three elements three elements because i am considering three multi sets i can consider four multi sets in which case i'll have four elements in each set in each multi set okay why do we say so three multi set do we define do we use like the, the specific number three for something or yes so so k is something that you have picked at the very beginning and you are considering k multi sets here okay we'll define what k should be so for a fixed epsilon for a fixed epsilon you will define that k has to be something multiplied by 1 over epsilon square in the at a later stage okay but this is how you define a k multi set and you have uniform distribution over elements of the multi set and you induce a strategy a mixed strategy p which actually sits in the original original set delta m okay so what we have done is remember delta m is an uncountable set it has uncountable number of elements but i am just concentrating on a very finite number of elements within this set okay so this is how so these points are essentially delta m k okay they are distributed within this set in a certain fashion okay and the the most important result is most important result that the paper proved is as follows uh the theorem for every epsilon greater than 0 pick k equals 12 log n so in this case n is equal to m in this paper n is equal to m okay so 12 log n over epsilon square so i pick an epsilon greater than 0 i pick k in this fashion then there exist p epsilon q epsilon which is in delta m or delta n k cross delta n k okay which is epsilon nat so this is uh, there exists p epsilon q epsilon which is epsilon nash equilibrium actually it, it satisfies another property if p star so this is an epsilon nash further if p star q star is nash equilibrium then p epsilon transpose a q epsilon minus p star transpose a q star absolute value is less than epsilon and p epsilon transpose b q epsilon minus p star transpose b q star absolute value is less than epsilon actually uh this p epsilon q epsilon depends on p star q star that you have chosen so i should probably i should write it here instead of here for every epsilon greater than 0 and for every p star q star which is nash equilibrium you define a k in this fashion and then there exist a p epsilon q epsilon in this set which is an epsilon nash equilibrium and it satisfies these two conditions okay so the p epsilon q epsilon depends on epsilon and also depends on p star and q star which is the equilibrium that you might be concentrating on okay 
So the cool thing is, you started with this big space, delta m, you identified a small finite subset of delta m, and what you are able to prove is that there exists an epsilon Nash equilibrium within that smaller set. So all you need to do is look at, consider each point in the set and check whether it's an epsilon Nash equilibrium or not. Okay. Um, I have to admit that this is not a, even though I'm saying that it's a small set, it's a finite set, you know, it's not, doesn't have non-trivial number of elements. If you pick the value of epsilon too small, let's say epsilon was 0 0.1, then this is k's of the order of 100. Okay, and when k is of the order of 100, the number of vectors p you can come up with, which satisfies this is humongous, okay? So, so really this set grows very large as you reduce the value of epsilon. So I don't want to cover the proof of this theorem uh, because it's uh, somewhat complicated and requires concentration inequalities. But I do want to show, well, give you an idea of how they actually prove this result uh, because it's a very general, it's a very good technique to prove theorems of this type, okay? So here is the technique. So it's a technique that requires concentration inequalities, but it's able to get you the result that you want. Yeah. Sorry? Sorry, I didn't, I can't hear you. Uh, well, they don't give you a they don't give you a way to compute an epsilon Nash, but you can check whether these conditions well not this condition, but the condition for epsilon Nash is satisfied for every point in the set or not. And what it says is you will be able to find a point in the set. You know, this, this also points you to the, to, the, to the idea that if solving a problem is difficult, you look for an approximately optimal solution. Okay, so that's, uh, that's what you are trying to do here. But we don't know the p star, p star, so how do we know which one is the epsilon? You know that there exists one p star, q star. Okay, so, but p epsilon q epsilon, even though it depends on p star q star, actually it sits in this set which is independent of p star q star. So all you have to do is just keep checking. If you pick a point, what, what do we check? Uh, I don't know p star q star. You remember what the definition of epsilon Nash is? You want p f no, you want p transpose a q epsilon less than equal to p epsilon transpose a. Q epsilon plus epsilon, right? So instead of checking it for all p, all you have to check it is for each ei, each unit vector ei, okay? So that's m inequalities here and then n inequalities for the other player. So that's all you need to check. Okay, so here is the idea. I define a k-multi set, uh, generate k-multi sets from p star q star, okay? And let's say it induces a map p prime, well, p prime is used. Uh, I hope none of you will confuse between prime and transpose, okay? So let me just write it as P prime, Q prime. So, so I have P star. Uh, I know that it exists, so I have P star. And I generate a K multi set from P star, okay? So I use the samples from P star to generate a K multi set. And I get a 
distribution p prime q prime from that uh, by having an uh, having a uniform distribution over the multi set over the k multi set and then i consider events p1 which is p prime transpose a q prime minus p star transpose a q star less than epsilon or oh, less than epsilon over 2 i define phi 2 p prime transpose b q prime minus p star transpose b q star less than epsilon over 2 and then uh, what symbol haven't we used so far sorry lambda gamma oh actually I'm going to use it today <laughs> so not gamma uh, let me make it uh, capital capital phi 1 I which is equal to absolute value of E i I want to write a unit vector in delta m so let me write it as E i transpose a q prime less than p prime transpose a q prime plus epsilon e i in delta m and this is a e i equals to 0 0 1 0 0 okay where 1 is at the ith position so that is my vector e i and then I define capital P 2 i same thing uh, P prime transpose B E i less than P prime transpose B e i plus epsilon and in this case E i is in delta n. Okay. that p prime q sorry p epsilon and q epsilon uh, if it exists in the set if p epsilon q epsilon exist in delta m k cross delta n k and m is equal to n so let me just write it as delta n k cross delta n k then p epsilon comma q epsilon would actually exist in phi 1 intersection phi 2 intersection i equals 1 to n phi 1 i intersection i equals 1 to n P to I. Okay, I want to pause here, and I want you all to stare at these equations. Okay. So my goal is to prove this theorem which says that for every p star q star for every epsilon greater than 0 there exists an epsilon Nash which is close to this Nash equilibrium. 
close in the expected cost sense. Okay, so how do I go about proving this result? Uh, what I do is I generate k multi sets from p star q star and then I define certain number of events strategically so that so that I know that if a p epsilon q epsilon exist in this particular set that I started with, then it must lie in these in this intersection. Okay. So let me call this as a set capital C. What they actually prove is that the probability of this capital C is actually greater than zero. Okay. That's what they prove. That if you generate k multi sets from p star q star and consider these events and you consider the intersection of all these events, the probability that you get over that event is strictly positive. And they of course do it by proving that the probability of phi complement is actually strictly less than one. Okay, so this is what they prove. Yeah. No, no, you see they are generating k multi sets from p star q star through sampling, independent sampling. Okay, so this, the, yes, so this probability depends on p star q star. Okay, so does everyone know why, how we generate k multi sets from p star q star? You essentially toss a coin, so let's say my p star was 2 over 3 and 1 over 3 and my k is equal to 5. Okay, so I, well this is a biased coin. Uh, okay, so I toss a coin, biased coin, which has the probability of heads as 2 over 3 and probability of tails as 1 over 3. And I run it 5 times, I run this, I toss this coin 5 times, so first time t appeared, t appeared, well, well, yeah, let me just say T appeared, then T appeared, then B appeared, then T, and then B. This is what the outcome of five experiments is. So I get my P prime as 3 over 5, and my B is 2 over 5, okay? So this is what my P prime is, okay? So this is what I did. So when you are doing this sampling according to this distribution P star, you essentially induce a probability distribution over P prime and Q prime that are achievable through this sampling process. And all you say is, well, the probability of phi is strictly positive. And how do you show that? Well, you show that the probability of phi complement is strictly less than one using Herbding inequality or other concentration inequalities. It doesn't matter if you haven't studied it. I want you to know that this is the method that can be used in general. Okay, this is a very powerful method to be used in general to show an existence result of this type. Okay, and we'll, we'll come back to this method again when we talk about approximate Kara Theodori theorem in the later half of this, of this class. Actually, it looks like the first half is already over. <laughs> okay, so. So we'll, we'll, we'll come, up, come up with, uh, so this, this idea is fairly general, that's what I want you to know. And if ever you have to prove a result of this type, you should try and look for ideas which, which are somewhat probabilistic. Okay, so instead of trying to prove a fixed point theorem over a discrete set, you are proving a probabilistic result using concentration inequalities and that gives you the solution straight away. Okay without much trouble. Okay. Okay, so now this, uh, this, so this gives you, this is probably the first method which could give you an epsilon Nash equilibrium for a general game. Okay, maybe I'm wrong but I don't seem to remember reading any paper that talks about computation of epsilon Nash uh, using using any possible uh, by solving this 
problem by solving this lemke hausen algorithm approximately uh, and and you see this result is completely different this way of doing this way of finding p epsilon q epsilon it doesn't have any reference to lemke hausen algorithm whatsoever okay the optimization problem that we have studied so far right so it's completely general very nice result and can give you is guaranteed to give you an epsilon nash uh, within the set uh, of uh, restricted distributions any question so far on this method okay so you have to go through each and every point in this set in this product set and then you have to check whether the point is epsilon nash or not so it's it's not elegant it's more like enumeration okay but you have somehow restricted yourself to look at a very small set as compared to the original humongous set okay so now i want to uh, talk about a second algorithm that computes epsilon nash but the idea there is that the matrix a plus b is a sparse matrix okay what is is everyone familiar with sparse matrix a sparse matrix has many zero entries okay only some of the entries of the matrix is non uh, is non zero okay so that's called a sparse matrix so let's let's talk about the other algorithm so assumption a plus b equals to c is part you know i am writing it as an assumption because it turns out that it has good properties for sparse matrices but it can also compute an epsilon nash for the whole uh, for the original problem uh, without the sparsity constraint so what is sparsity so i want to define sparsity so i say that s uh equals to number of non zero columns of c okay that's my uh that's the measure of sparsity measure of sparsity okay so think about it you have like a huge a plus b matrix it's not a zero sum game it's not a rank one game okay but what you see is most of the entries are zero and in fact only uh, even though n could be 1000 only 4 or 5 or 10 or 15 columns are non negative uh, i mean non zero and rest of them are all zero okay so that's the kind of game that you should you should be thinking about when you are talking about this algorithm and then i am going to define uh and the other thing i want to define is i pick an l which is max of 2 and log base 2 of s and i define i want to define the l norm of a vector x of x in rn that's given by summation of i equals 1 to n absolute value of xi raised to l and then 1 over l okay this is something that you might be familiar with this is known as the l norm of a vector x in rn okay it's a fairly general idea of defining an l norm
okay i want to define i am taking a detour into a linear algebra again i want to define carathio doris theorem so the idea of carathio doris theorem is as follows x is in so s is a subset of r d and x is in the convex hull of the set s then there exists a s prime which is a subset of s and absolute value of s prime not the absolute value the number of elements in s prime is less than equal to d plus 1 such that x is in the convex hull of s prime okay so what is the picture let's say i have four points okay that's my original set s s has four points these four points i pick a value x which is in the convex hull of s so what is convex hull of x so well i am going to join all these points this is the convex hull of s so if you take the linear the convex combination of the points in s you get any point within this set you can actually get it as a convex combination of these four points so i pick a point x here in this set there exists an s prime which is a subset of s so remember s was these four points so i have to come up with and this is r2 so this is this is r2 right so what this says is so i have to come up with the set s prime so that it has three points and s prime should be a subset of s and x should be in the convex hull of uh, s prime so if you look at the figure this point this point and this point these are the three points and if you take the convex hull of these three points you notice that x is in the convex hull of the set so this is true in any d dimensional space rd however you can have you can be in a higher dimensional space but the set s might be a low dimensional figure in this high dimensional space uh to give you an example consider r3 uh you can take a line segment with two points and any point in the segment can be written as a convex combination of these two points and that's because line is a one dimensional object even if it sits in a three dimensional space D plus one. What if we take two more points on those vertices to be two for the set S prime? Oh. Yeah. So. Yeah, you can at least find one subset S prime okay. of the original set S. Okay, at least one subset. Okay, you can of course have larger and larger subset. It's fine, but. Uh, this essentially is giving you a minimal representation of a point within this larger set uh, convex hull of the original set s okay so look think about it in three dimensions r3 okay you are considering a line segment in r3 but what you have to note is well you know a line segment or a line in general in any higher dimension space is actually a one uh, two dimensional object well it's a one dimensional object okay so a line is a one dimensional object so you can actually find two points right so d is equal to 1 so d is equal to 1 so you can find two points and well these are the two points uh, themselves because you started with two points only so those are the two points so that any point x which is in the convex hull of these two points can be written as a convex hull of 
the two points in S prime. So what I want to say is, even if you're looking at a higher dimensional space, but you're looking at a low dimensional object in a higher dimensional space, you have to make sure that D is taken as the lower of whatever the dimension of the object that you are considering is. Okay, is, is, that, is that clear? No? Uh, so let's say you are, let's say you are in R3 and you consider a hyperplane in R3. So a plane in R3 is a two-dimensional object, okay? So you have to take D is equal to two instead of three. Even though your original set is R3, since you're only considering a two-dimensional object, your D is equal to two, which means you can find three points so that any point within the plane is actually a convex combination of three points in the plane. Okay, that's the idea. So that's uh, Karathidari's theorem. It was proved, I think, in 19 or 1910 or something. Okay, so fairly old result. Okay, yeah. Uh, so yes, so yes, edges are part of the convex hull. So convex hull is a closed set. It's the smallest closed set that contains all the points. Okay, so it contains the edges as well. So this proof comes from so approximate. Sorry. More, sorry? Closed set, closed convex set, yeah, closed convex set that contains all the points, yeah. Approximate Kara Theodore's theorem. You know, I think these ideas are fairly, uh, uh, fairly general, so don't think of it only in terms of games. You probably can use it in your research as well. So, for every epsilon greater than zero, for every p in delta m, there exist p prime. Well, let me first say, for every epsilon greater than zero, for every p in delta m, define k equals 4 L gamma square over epsilon square and gamma is max of the norm of X L. This is the L norm. X L, X in delta m. Okay, so I'm defining it that way. And I pick, I can pick any L as well. Okay, so L is also something that's uh, given. So for every epsilon greater than zero, for every P in delta m, and for every L greater than equal to two, I'm going to define k and gamma in this fashion. So k is 4 multiplied by L over epsilon square multiplied by gamma square, where gamma is defined in this fashion. You know, I think for x in delta m, oh, I see. In, this is more general result, OK? So I can just write x in s, OK? s is this set that I'm starting with. <coughs> There, there exist a, okay, this P is not in delta M. Let me write it as P in conv of S. There exist a P prime in, in, uh, I haven't defined what, you know, let me just keep it delta M. 
Well, okay, so here is what I'll say. This result is more general, but just let me write it for delta m because that's what we need. There exists a p prime in delta m k such that p prime minus p in the L norm is less than epsilon. Okay, so that's the approximate Carathéodory's theorem. Okay. And the proof of this uh, result is also using a similar idea as we studied in the previous case. So you define a random event, so not a random event, you define events, so you generate this p prime, remember p prime is coming in delta m k, right? So you generate p prime according to some distribution and then you consider those events Basically, the event would be something like p prime minus p less than epsilon, right? And you try to prove that the probability that that event would occur is strictly positive, which proves the existence of at least one p prime within that restricted set, okay? So, you know, it's fine if you don't understand these ideas because you can always go back to paper and read the complete proof, but you should keep it at the back of your mind if you have to prove a result of this type wherein you take a larger set, you pick a point in it, or, or you come up with some way of generating points within that set. So this is one way of generating points within delta m. Uh, you want to prove that at least one point will satisfy some property. How would you prove that? Well, the way to prove it is, one way to prove it is somehow, one way to prove it is you prove it directly. I don't know how you would prove directly because you, you know I'm suffering from the curse of knowledge. I've read this paper before so I know exactly how to prove it. Okay, but maybe you can prove it some other way. So one way is you pick P prime in delta MK and you pick epsilon ball around P prime and then you take union of P prime in delta MK and then you show that this contains your original delta m, okay? So this is what you want to prove, right? So every point p in delta m can be reached uh, within the epsilon neighborhood of p prime, okay? That's what you want to prove. But proving this result is very difficult. So instead, you prove something using a probabilistic method, okay? And that's much easier to prove because all you need is Hoefding inequality or Frechet inequality or Markov inequality. Those are all fairly well known, simple to understand uh, concentration results in probability. Okay, so that's the that's the idea I want you to take away in today's lecture. Okay, there are easier methods to prove complicated results. So here is how you how you solve how you get an epsilon Nash for a sparse matrix C. So you, the goal is find P epsilon, Q epsilon, such that P epsilon transpose C, Q epsilon is greater than or equal to pi one plus pi two minus epsilon. What is pi one? Pi one is uh, the cost achieved by any other uh, uh, P 
Yeah, so Pi 1 and Pi 2 are feasible solutions of Lemke Hausen problem where Pi 1 and Pi 2 are feasible in Lemke Hausen. Let me write what the Lemke Hausen method is. Uh, we want to maximize over P, Q, Pi 1, Pi 2. I should remember this by now. Okay, P transpose C Q minus Pi 1 minus Pi 2 such that A Q is less than or equal to Pi 1 and B transpose P is less than or equal to Pi 2. Okay, so that's my Lemke Hausen. Yeah. yeah, yeah, Okay, so, so if you consider a feasible solution of this particular uh, problem, so what is a feasible solution? So you figure out P epsilon Q epsilon pi 1 pi 2 that satisfies this inequality. If it also satisfies this inequality, then it is an epsilon nat. That is what, uh, that is a fairly easy thing to prove and then you want to find such a P epsilon Q epsilon. Okay, so this is the, so that is what we want to, we want to prove. So here is the idea, I consider this problem CPU is a convex problem where I want to minimize the distance between C Q minus U, the L norm. Okay, this is the L norm, and I want to minimize with respect to P Q pi 1 pi 2. Okay, such that P transpose U is greater than or equal to pi 1 plus pi 2 minus epsilon over 2. A Q is less than or equal to pi 1 1 M and B transpose P is less than or equal to pi 2 1 M. Okay, and the algorithm is so S is the sparsity number of non zero columns of well, this is equal to number of non zero columns of C. My L is max of two and log base two of S. I pick my K equals four L over epsilon square. So remember there was this gamma term, but the gamma term is going to be equal to one because you are considering a simplex. So gamma is equal to 1 and then I am going to assume that m is equal to n for the time being, does not matter. You can modify the algorithm for different values of m and n. So for every q delta and k pick 
u equals to c transpose q not c transpose q c q there is no transpose here okay so so i pick u equals c q and then i solve v u is equals to minimum of c q minus u l norm subject to constraints okay these are the constraints constraints in star and then if v of u is less than equal to epsilon over 2 then p star or p epsilon q epsilon is a epsilon nash equilibrium okay where p epsilon q epsilon is actually the solution to this problem you know what i want to keep this q distinct from this q so i'm going to write a tilde here because you are picking various values of u and then you are trying to solve this problem which is a which is a problem over p q pi 1 and pi 2 so so that's the that's the idea this is a, a another way you start with a big set you come up with a smaller set delta nk okay coming from the k multi sets k uniform vectors uh so you come up with k multi sets you compute q tilde so that gives you a finite number of values of possible u and then you solve this problem and what you check is the optimal solution so optimal value of this objective function should be less than or equal to epsilon over 2 you know that such a solution will always exist because epsilon nash exist in this class of problems okay and and at every point of time you're solving a convex problem so you are guaranteed to converge to the optimal solution because your set is uh your set is a compact set okay so because you are starting from a compact set you will converge to something all you have to check is the optimal value coming out of this optimization problem so that's the that's the idea here when do you use this algorithm well this works best when your c matrix the c matrix here is sparse okay because where does that sparsity feature l is max of 2 and log base 2 of s okay so that feature here so k could be small if your matrix is not sparse then this could be large but if this is small if your matrix is sparse then l is going to be small so k is going to be small so you're looking at a smaller set okay instead of a larger set so If you think about it in the previous problem remember in the previous problem previous algorithm your k was 12 log of n over epsilon square so this is a reduction in comparison to the previous in comparison to the previous algorithm here k is 4 log base 2s over epsilon square there it was 12 log n over epsilon square now of course if your s is equal to n which is a not sparse matrix you know it's full rank uh then this will be 4 log n over epsilon square and this is k 12 log n over epsilon square okay so it's still a reduction uh in the number of possibilities that you have to check 
but not by a big margin. It's really very good for sparse matrices, okay, when C is sparse. So the, so the idea is, you know, this is still an evolving field. This algorithm was actually uh, proposed in 2015 and was published in 2016 or maybe 20, 2016, I think. Okay, so this is fairly new algorithm. So this field is still evolving. And the takeaway is, if you want to compute Nash equilibrium, maybe for the original problem it is difficult, but you can make assumptions of low rank or you can make assumptions about sparsity of the matrices and you can come up with fast algorithms to solve the problem, okay? And actually Joe had implemented this algorithm last year and as I mentioned that this algorithm, even though it computes, it's, it's a polynomial time algorithm because of this one over epsilon squared term, you know, it really takes a lot of time to compute in some cases, okay? So, so that's really an issue here. So, so far what we have done is uh, we've talked about different algorithms for computing Nash equilibrium. Uh, you will implement some of it as part of assignment five, actually rank one. You will only implement the rank one game because it's a very clean algorithm. So I'll ask you to implement it on MATLAB and you will see how it converges to the Nash equilibrium. Uh, these algorithms are also good. Uh, but it takes a lot of effort to, in, to write a code to do these class of, uh, to implement these class of algorithms. But I, but I want you to see for your problems, the problems that you are interested in, what class of algorithms would make more sense and maybe your problem would have some structure which you can exploit and come up with different algorithms based on the ideas that have been presented. Okay, these algorithms are not the best algorithms, okay, because these algorithms, the best algorithms will be done, will be, will be invented for a specific application, okay, and by exploiting the features of a specific application, you can uh, come up with better algorithms. So, if you, if I think about it from my research, I deal a lot with uh, cybersecurity, which are zero-sum games, so, you know, I deal with all the easy problems, okay. But but somebody at least will work on, well, maybe Joe will work on non-zero-sum games, and so he'll probably implement some of these ideas in his, in his research. Um, there's another topic, potential games, that I want to cover very quickly. But that's part of the assignment, so you will get to do, understand that uh, potential game in depth in your assignment. So I'll just give you a brief introduction to what a potential game is. But any questions so far on this, on this method? No? Okay, so what is potential game? So I have AI, it's the action set, maybe a subset of R, Rn, action set of player I, of player I, and is probably it's going to be a subset of Rn, and then Ui is the utility function of player I. So we say that P is an ordinal potential function if and only if u i a i a minus i minus u i a i prime 
a minus i is greater than 0 if and only if p a i a minus i minus p a i prime a minus i is greater than 0. Okay, so this is the definition of an ordinal potential function. And there are some games in economics, uh, congestion games in particular, uh, which we haven't studied so far. Uh, but it's a very important class of problems. So there are problems in economics that satisfy this kind of condition. Uh, actually, I've given an example in the assignment so you can actually see that this this type of potential function may exist in some problems. Okay, so the thing is there is a unique function P, it doesn't depend on the player, okay? Players have their own utility function, but there is a function P that somehow has the same variation or, or at least it's not the same variation, but similar sign, a variation of similar sign. If one player unilaterally changes its action, okay? So the change in utility is also positive, then the change in potential is going to be positive. If the change in potential is positive, then the change in utility will also be positive, okay? They don't have to be related to each other. All they have to have is the same sign. If this is greater than zero, then this is greater than zero. If this is greater than zero, then this should be greater than zero. Then you call P to be an ordinal potential function for this game. And the result is the theorem by Shapley and Maunderer is that uh, the game A1, AN, and U1, un is strategically equivalent to to the game a1 an and p p So you started with a game that was non-zero sum, but it had certain property, okay? It had some ordinal potential function. And what they actually proved is if such a potential function exists, then you consider another game where the action sets are the same, but the utility function is just a potential function, okay? So they have the same function, same utility function. All the players have the same utility function they are strategically equivalent. So every Nash equilibrium of this game is a Nash equilibrium of this game, and every Nash equilibrium of this game is a Nash equilibrium of this game. Okay, so it's a very strong result. So when you look at this, look at this game, what is a Nash equilibrium in this game? What would a Nash equilibrium in this game be? Where every agent, so imagine this is the problem. Every agent has the same utility function. What would a Nash, what would an ideal, not an ideal, but what would be a natural Nash equilibrium in this game? Let's make this assumption. Assume that all the players are cooperating in this new game that we have formulated. Okay, they are cooperating. They, what would be a, natural equilibrium yeah well they have the they have different action set but p is the same the utility function is the same so think of this let's say you found out a1 to an star which is or which is in the arg max of p a1 an Okay, you know that any unilateral deviation will give a worse payoff to any player, P, right? Because 
Yeah, so that's fairly easy because now you're moving away from the optimal point, the arg max point. So this is a Nash equilibrium of this game. Therefore, this is a Nash equilibrium of the original game. Okay, so you started with a non-zero sum game. You transformed it into a team problem, okay, where everyone is cooperative and everyone wants to maximize the same objective function. And then you ran gradient descent or whatever Newton's algorithm or whatever to compute the arg max of this uh, utility function. And you know that the solution you get is also going to be the optimal, we be a Nash equilibrium of the original game. So congestion games which are useful for transportation networks or useful even in uh, communications, although I, I haven't seen much congestion game in communication, but congestion games are games in which you have to uh, pass traffic through links that are shared among different agents. Okay, so you can see why it's important from a communication viewpoint as well. So if you have, many of the congestion games have a potential function, and so you can run gradient descent or Newton's method to compute the arg max, and that would give you a solution to the original problem you started with. Okay, so that's another algorithm for computing Nash equilibrium of a non-zero sum game. Okay, particularly those where action spaces are subsets of a real line or Rn. Okay, so I'm not proving this because this is part of your assignment, but it's not very difficult to prove it. You know, it's, I'm trying to make easy assignments. Okay, you have spent enough blood and sweat in this course so far, so, so it should be easy. Any question about about uh, ordinal potential? No. Okay, so so far we have. What have we studied? We have studied approximate n e by by considering by solving low rank game. That was the first algorithm we started with. Then second one was rank one game, and the third and fourth algorithm we studied right now, so that was for C sparse matrix. And then the fifth one is through potential function. <clears throat> okay, so multiple algorithms that we have studied, hopefully some of these will be useful for the class of problems you might be looking at. So next time onwards, I'm going to talk about mechanism design, which is another important topic. And uh, the part on algorithmic game theory restricted to looking at solving a matrix game or solving a game is kind of done. Uh, now we'll talk about mechanism design auctions, and then we'll talk about algorithmic auctions and algorithmic mechanism design, okay, Even, uh, in the subsequent lectures. So. We'll forget about finite games for the rest of the semester. Okay. After Thanksgiving, I'm planning to do cooperative game theory. And if time permits, we'll do uh, models of bounded rationality, which is another important part. So bounded rationality is how do humans make decisions? Okay. So humans cannot do all this computation in their head when they are making a decision about whether to buy a spinach in a supermarket or whether to buy a juice, right? So, so we have to talk about models of bounded rationality. So if we get to, if we have points, if we have time after Thanksgiving, then we'll talk also about mount, models for bounded rationality. It's a very important topic. Okay, no questions, so thank you. I'll see you guys on Thursday.